Man like Mark Sullivan, worry yourself. Stay tuned for the chilling episode. Woo! A positive mental attitude can clear away all obstacles which stand between you and your major purpose in life. This is the Snowboard Project featuring Mark Sullivan and the Beat. The Snowboard Project. The, the Snowboard, snowboard Project. Project. The Snowboard Project. Welcome back to the Snowboard Project. I'm Mark Sullivan. And I am the Beeb, and we are coming at you with uh, episode number eight. That's right. Yeah, episode eight is tackling who, Mark? Uh, Ricky Bauer. He is the head coach of the United States uh, Olympic halfpipe snowboarding team, the U.S. snowboard team Olympic halfpipe coach. Now, Ricky Bauer has obviously been a name that we've been hearing in snowboarding and competitive snowboarding for uh, quite some time here. I remember as a kid, uh, you know, doing USSA uh, competitions and going to them and always, you know, Ricky and like Rob Kingwell and I think like Lance Pittman. We're did always did like, you compete against him directly? I did you? not compete against him directly because okay. he was probably six or seven years older than me. Okay. But I remember being there and being like, Ricky was the man. You know, you you yeah. go to these competitions, he'd just be dominating. Um, yep. And uh, so I guess this is, our, you know, we're tackling basically making the transition from athlete to coach. coach. Yeah, one of the best coaches in the world, right. honestly. Right. And I mean, check out like how many like Olympic medals like his his athletes have won uh, underneath his coaching and so yeah we're gonna we're gonna follow that journey from basically being an athlete chasing that dream to chasing mm-hmm. a new dream which is like okay so he didn't go to the Olympics as an athlete so he ended up going as a coach awesome well this is and we are we are doing a three-part series this week because we're tackling a few different a few different things in Ricky's life obviously that and then episode number nine which is our second part which is we'll tackle parenting yeah which as we all know as a coach is half the challenge of coaching the kids which is also coaching the parents yep and then and then and part number three is going to be um, progression, learning new tricks, knowing when to chuck your meat, how to visualize all that stuff. It's really interesting, actually. And I learned a lot um, in both parts two and three. And I kind of knew Ricky already. So I kind of knew some of that story. But it, I'd say it's definitely worth tuning into this three part series for Ricky Bauer. So definitely pay attention to the next three days. We have uh, Ricky Bauer coming up. We have parenting and we have learning new tricks coming at you. Let's go ahead and roll into uh, episode eight. Ricky Bauer. Don't forget to support advertising free snowboarding media at patreon.com. The Snowboard Project. The The Snowboard snowboard project. Project. The Snowboard Project. Today, I am with Ricky Bauer, and Ricky Bauer is the head coach of the United States Olympic Halfway Team. Uh, I guess head coach of the Halfway Team for U.S. Snowboarding. I mean, what's your actual title, Ricky? Yeah, I would be uh, head coach for the U.S. snowboard team. Head coach for, for half-pipe. US, for half-pipe. Okay. For, yeah. Now, how do you get into being a half-pipe coach? I I know the answer, maybe. So I, you know, but uh. <laughs> yeah. How do you uh, get into well, it? I I half-pipe kind of uh, the long forgotten discipline, but I started um, as a snowboarder myself. Um, I was a competitor back in the mid to late 90s into the early 2000s and um i um it's kind of funny that i got into half pipe because i grew up in utah and um we only had the half pipe at well park west which is now part of park city at the canyons um Mm -hmm. but you know we would a majority of our time was just uh riding powder and hitting kickers and into powder landings and you know the half pipe was something we did when they had the random event and the you know the half pipe would get made the the week before 
by you know all the guys from Salty Peaks and Milo Sport team coming up and and you know hand shaping it. You know Jeff Davis and you know I grew up with the Linuses, so Tor Bjorn and Eric Linus's older brother and those three would always come up and you know it was uh, it was a smaller knit community and you know and it got all the the kids that were really stoked on shredding and learning tricks to come over to one area and, and ride the half pipe. And so I guess that's why it was appealing to me just because it would brought all the rippers in the whole state together for one thing. And it was super cool. So that's kind of how I got started in competing. And then I, I got to be decently good and made the, got asked to go uh, to on a few trips with the U S snowboard team when it was first started in the, 90s like 90 95 96 season i went to a few events Mm -hmm. and then i realized that you know this is like a full-on thing there's the full tour there that was all on the fifth tour but there was the isf tour going on at the same time and it was just a really cool thing so i decided that i wanted to try to pursue that and uh basically just from determination just like learned how to ride half pipe I didn't have a coach or anything and and then you know they invited me to be on the team in the 96 97 season and so I started traveling around with that crew which was really cool at the time you know it was like Dan Smith from Colorado, Lael Gregory, Dustin Del Giudice, Tommy Shashin, Ross Powers I mean all awesome dudes A, a lot of those guys I am still very good friends with um it's you funny. Know, it's 20, funny you say that. 20, Go ahead. Twenty three years later. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny because it's like you're not like they were sick riders. No, that wasn't the first thing you said about them. They're awesome dudes. You know what yeah, I mean? They are great people. I mean, I I value every single one of those people as as just awesome humans and just people that I want to stay in touch with and and still talk to you in my 40s i mean so what do you think you about know? like uh snowboarding maybe made them into cool people because it seems like all the people i i have that same experience where it's like god all these people a lot of people i can't say all of them because i know some bad people too in snowboarding i just don't associate with them anymore but uh or i've met them anyway but like what do you think about snowboarding um makes these people into like good people or like people who are i don't know i mean what what do you think that, about I, snowboarding I, I, I feel like uh, our the general uh, idea about snowboarding attracts cool people or people that we think are cool because they, um, you know, it's more like people that are playful. You know, they, it's not like a traditional way of going down the mountain on skis. You know, get from point A to point B, and um, you know, snowboarding revolutionized skiing as much as anyone be, would be loath to say it but like all the free skiing and stuff that wouldn't you know those guys would have never came along if it wasn't for snowboarding um if those guys would you know freestyle skiing would still be what it is it'd be aerials and moguls and you'd probably have extreme skiers like the scott schmidt era but snowboarding came along and opened up a whole new avenue or a way to look at the mountain and you know i feel like those people are people that I relate with, um, people that choose to ride, you know, the mountain and, and play around and uh, look at the mountain differently and, and look at every little feature on the mountain as something they can shred. And and just that overall uh, creativity, the overall um, playful nature, the, the realization that it's uh, something that you're doing for fun and really embracing that, I guess, is what makes them cool people. And and then people like Ross and, and Leo and all those guys that, that really pushed the sport to the next level, they really enjoyed it so much that they were trying to do all these amazing things at such a young age. And, you know, that, that motivation to get better and that, that stoke is, you know, why they're awesome people because they're still the same way as older gentlemen. Yeah. So did you... <laughs> they're still the same snowboarder shred heads. Yeah. Um, so did snowboarding when you're competing and I know it takes a lot of work to be at the top of the game both then and now I mean today it's pretty apparent you know that obviously you're not going to yeah. do like a 
1440 back to back without really putting in some hard work and paying some dues. But back then, I mean, you guys were still kind of pushing the progression <clears throat> of the sport. Excuse me. Was there ever a time that you were like that snowboarding was not fun for you? Like that became almost like too stressful because of the pressure or or because, you know, you just had to be out there training every day to be at the top of the game. Yeah, I think that was more towards the end of my career when I put a lot of pressure on myself to, you know, try to make the Olympic team. And, um, you know, that there was some times early on in my career where we were traveling. I mean, the, the tour we used to do was insane. We'd start the year off in, in Europe and then go up to, you know, Scandinavia and then back to Canada and then to Japan and then back to the U S and then back to Europe to finish off the sea. I mean, it was just like this nonsensical jet setting. And so you basically show up at these half pipes and back then, you know, there wasn't a lot of good grooming happening and a lot of places, you know, the Austrian army or something was hand shaping the half pipe. So it would totally suck. So you'd show up at these half pipes and, you traveled halfway around the world and you'd have like four days and two of them were contests to ride the thing. And that wasn't that fun. And you'd be in Europe and you'd be at some tiny mountain in the middle of nowhere. You know, those, I remember being frustrated those times, but I think ultimately for me, snowboarding the change when I really put a lot of pressure on myself to try to make the Olympic team and, um, yeah. you know, and put in it didn't you know it didn't work out i ended up tearing my acl and this you know trying to qualify for the team and uh that whole thing was you know i wasn't in a great mental state at the time either i was you know late teens early 20s and just not able to deal with pressure that well and i didn't uh you know i i put two i i if i had a probably just kept with the same attitude that I had when I was 15 it probably might have worked out different who knows hard saying not knowing but um I didn't ride as much pal yeah that, that, that was a question I, I had for you did you ever like just ride half pipe and not free ride or, or ride jumps or or just ride with oh your no. friends <clears throat> I always I always I always free rode and I would always try to ride with my friends as much as possible I had you know like before I got on the tour, I had, you know, passes at Snowbird and Brighton and a super fun group of guys that I rode with and girls. And, you know, that that was like the heyday of my progression was mm -hmm. that when I had that scene at home going on. And, um, you know, the, the love of the sport and just like how it translates into – your ability to ride half pipe and, and free riding especially is probably the best thing anyone could ever do for riding half pipe. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to be able to go fast and you know what, as smooth as those half pipes look, there's always bumps and inconsistencies and weirdness in them. And, and you need to, especially now you need to go so fast. So like being able to ride with speed through chunder and bumps and whatever may come your way and in charge is, you know, that was always the funnest thing to me. I mean, still to this day, one of my favorite movies is uh, Critical Condition. You know, Sean yeah. Farmer, Nick Parada, and those guys just sending and going full speed everywhere. Like, that's the type of stuff I like to watch. Like, watch when I watch snowboarding um, yeah. and the riding I used to try to emulate when I was younger. Those movies are few and far between these days. They are. <laughs> uh, anyway, how, so how did you take like that failure of not making the Olympic team? Well, actually, let's not call it failure. Let's call it disappointment, right? Because I don't think it was a yeah. failure. You were an amazing rider. You had, I mean, honestly, I always had respect for your riding when you were competing. But let, let's say, how did you take that disappointment and then and translate that into becoming like one of the, arguably one of the best coaches in the world? Well, what happened was I had a limited number of sponsors to begin with i mean let's not beat around the bush i was never a phenomenal snowboarder like ross powers or my buddy tommy i was pretty good but those guys you know 
they were killing it. And I realized after that 2002 season that I didn't have what it took to ride at that level. You know, I, I came close and I couldn't make myself, um, you know, step up and do the 1080s the way those guys could. And, you know, it was just too much for me. And I, so I, I got dropped by my sponsors at the time and, uh, you know, I was riding for European ski company. Um, <laughs> and, uh, did, did they have know, a name? Everyone was trying to get, everyone was trying to get into snowboarding. I was riding right. for vocal at the time. Okay. And, um, I was on their pro team and then, you know, after I was injured and after I didn't have the results and stuff, I got dropped. And so, um, and I had a clothing deal with Exynix too, which is the snowboard line of Phoenix, the freaking mogul company. <laughs> so I was, I mean, I, you know, I was kind of like, I took whatever I could get to make it happen. And it wasn't, it definitely wasn't the brands I would have chosen to road for, but that's what I ended up with. But anyway, when I, when I got dropped by everybody, I, I didn't want to keep trying to like do something that I ultimately didn't have my heart in anymore mm -hmm. um snowboarding wise and um so i had an opportunity to start working with the park city snowboard team okay. and um i had always like c because i wasn't that good of a rider and because i had to study everyone else so much um i had to really analyze what everyone else was doing just like watching people and talking to my friends that were way better than me you know, I learned a lot. So, um, I, I kind of coached myself and yeah, I worked with the U S team coaches, uh, Pete Del Giudice and Heath Van Aken at the time. And they were great. They taught me a lot of things. Um, but I, I, I felt like, uh, coaching was something that kind of came naturally to me, um, because of how hard I had to study the sport to get to where I ultimately got. And so, you weren't a natural ability, right? You didn't have that same natural ability as a raw, yeah. so you had no, to just I, like deter, the, your yeah. determination is what got you to the top or close to the top. Yeah, anyway. <clears throat> pretty much. Like, I didn't. I definitely it wasn't easy for me. It didn't come naturally, and I is scary every single day and really hard. Um, but that was also a fun thing to try to overcome. Um, I I was more of a slow twitch guy, like us. Uh, my dad was an Olympic uh, Nordic combined skier, so he was a phenomenal cross-country ski racer and ski jumper. And uh, when I was in high school, I ran cross-country and was actually really good at that. And he was always pushing me towards cross-country skiing or more endurance-related sports. And I was just too much in love with skateboarding and snowboarding to uh, even fathom something like that. And so I, you know... I, it, yeah, it was basically, I was not a quick guy. I didn't have the natural air awareness. You know, I, I learned it by going out to the Utah Olympic park and hitting the water ramps. Cause I live in park city, you know, mm -hmm. I couldn't afford to go up to Mount hood every summer. I never went to Mount hood when I was a kid. I only went when I got on the team and they, they were paying for it. But like, so I'd go to the Utah Olympic park and hit those super sketchy, water ramp into the pool and mm -hmm. learn how to flip that way and learn from the freaking aerial skiers which kind of messed me up but anyway i learned how to do it um I, I got coaching up there i got coaching from pete but I, I think i got a lot of coaching from just my friends and talking with people and having to study them so it just seemed natural for me to be a coach and an opportunity opened up and i got to actually run the park city snowboard team with mike bell um and my, you know it was mike bell and myself um back in 2003 and uh and yeah i i just started working with those kids and i realized i really liked it i liked the on hill side of it mm -hmm. dealing with uh some of the parents and some of that whole stuff was i was you know 22 23 at the time and i just couldn't deal i i didn't know i didn't <laughs> they were crazy 
they were super crazy. Still to me are. They were talking about. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know, there's there's parents out there that maybe have some different ideas about what their kids should do than what their kids actually have in their own heads. So, right. I don't know. That's a whole other thing. But yeah, the Park City team. You know, I, I got my feet wet with them, and, and at that very same season, um, Kelly Clark and Ross Powers and Gretchen Blyler and Andy Finch decided they wanted to start their own team through Octagon, um, the agency that they all wrote for. Yeah. And, that's who, uh, that's who uh, arranged all the sponsorships for those athletes. Y- yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's, yeah. In case you don't know, so, if you're listening, right? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> And so um, they they wanted to start their own team, and um, they uh, Kelly approached me. There was a Grand Prix at Park City, and I was up there with some of my Park City snowboard team kids. We were just up watching them train, and uh, Kelly was hiking by, and she was asking me questions about her riding and stuff. And I, you know, was just saying, "Oh, I think you should do this. I think you should do that." You know, just very nonchalant. But anyway, a few days later, she came up to me and was like, hey, you should be our coach for our team we're starting. And I hadn't even heard about it at that point. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, well, that's, wow, sounds wild. But, yeah, I'd consider it. And so what, they what year is this? To, what year is this we're talking this about? Was 90, this is 90, that was early, that was 93, or 03, 04 season. 03, 04. So that was in, okay. that was in December of 03. And in January of '04, I went out to the X Games um, with uh, Kelly. Um, Gretchen had torn her ACL, so she wasn't riding that year. But yeah, it was Kelly, Ross, um, What's... Andy, and uh, and then shortly then thereafter, Mason and uh, Luke. Now, uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically that's like the 2006 Olympic halfpipe team. So you weren't the you weren't the U.S. team coach, but basically every kid you were coaching went to the Olympics. Yeah. So as it turned <laughs> out, four four of the six athletes on the collection, um, you know, I started working with them in '03, and then four of the six made the Olympic team of eight. So half of the Olympic team was riders that I had been working with for the last couple of years. And, um, you know, that, you know, I'm not going to claim that. And those are great know, athletes really, in their own right. Right. They, they, were, they, they did they it on their own, but you were there to support it. <clears throat> yes, exactly. I mean, Andy was really coming into his own at that time. And, um, Mason was, just a young kid who was who was just a phenomenal snowboarder, endless potential with that kid. I mean, he is like he makes everything look so easy. I mean, mm-hmm. he, he it was funny, you know, a few years ago, the last open in Vail, they, it was the 30 year um, reunion of the open, and they were playing all these clips from all the opens over the years. And there was this clip of this kid that no one could recognize. And it was in, you know, the modern era. It was like when the pipe was over on the the, the new, where the, the pipe was at the end. I forget what side of the mountain. Stratton, it was Sun, Sun Bowl? The Sun Bowl, sun, yeah. Sun Bowl. It yeah. Was, well, when it was on the Sun Bowl side. And uh, That's right. they were like, man, who is that kid? You know, just blasting huge stylish airs and doing really smooth, styly grab tens and stuff back then. I was like, that's Mason. And no one could believe me because, you know, Mason kind of dropped off from riding half pipe and was just cruising. But I bet to this day, Mason can still be one of the stylish backside fives anyone's ever done. Ooh, that's um, a, that's a, that would be a good contest, the best backside five. That's always been one of my five? favorite tricks. <laughs> yeah, you know. I that was your good. trick too, right? I had a good back five. I, back, I had a good back five, and it morphed into the Michael Chuck over years, and so yep. I did Michael Chuck and the back five. And yeah. That's back funny. sevens and some some real crappy back nines, but um. Okay, so, so then yeah, why I did mean, you go from the collection to like being an actual U.S. team coach? When did that happen? So that happened after the 2006 Olympics, and so <laughs> I got to go to the Olympics with the collection, the athletes that qualified, and you know, they, half of the team was athletes that I'd worked with for 
you know, the three years up to the Olympics. So they were like, yeah, we got to bring Rick. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> Bud was thinking he didn't want to do it anymore and looking to do something else. And so he had announced that he was going to be leaving after that season. And so they started hitting me up that year to, to switch over to the U.S. team. And at the same time, I was noticing with the collection that it wasn't um, – they had this idea of how it was supposed to work. You know, it was supposed to be the athletes coming up with the plan for what they wanted to do and, you know, buy the athletes for the athletes, which is a great concept. But the problem is the athletes don't want to do all that planning. Right. And so a lot of that was falling on me, and which I was fine with, you know, because I had a good rapport with them, and I would try to, you know, really find out what they really wanted to do and, make it happen but the the main side of it was the <clears throat> on the sponsor front you know there was no consistency um and it didn't seem like the model was sustainable long term mm -hmm. and there was no plan for bringing in new people or a grassroots program of a, a rookie team a development team any of that stuff you know and so i didn't right. see it like uh you know, are they just going to continue to try to pick off the best top riders? And yeah, it was like a cherry-picking system, right? You would just yeah. cherry-pick the guy who rose to the top, and boom, you're on the team now. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and then, and then, but then they also had to ride for the same agency, and then, you know, there just seemed to be a lot of transition around the 2006 period, and I felt like for my own well-being and for you know, just looking at how things had gone and, you know, kind of guessing what would happen in the future, just played the safe card and chose to switch over to the U.S. team, mm -hmm. which, you know, <clears throat> the U.S. team has its great sides and its very challenging sides. You know, it's a, it's a big corporate entity. A bureaucracy. <laughs> Yeah, it's a bureaucracy, as any are. And yeah. um, we have a very, very cool um, group that works in the snowboard uh, side. And so all the people that I've worked with are, you know, like Peter Foley. I was seriously considering not switching over, but Peter Foley, who's been the head coach of the U.S. team since it started, he's been with the team for, um, what, like since 94? So yeah, <laughs> what's that, 20 eight years or 24 years yeah sorry. 24 yeah 24 years so he's you know he he i have a ton of respect for him and he was like you really should coach for us i think you'd be really good at it and and you know just having his support um meant a lot and so i i chose to uh switch over to the u.s team and you know it was uh it's been it's been a crazy ride since then, but it's uh yeah since that 2006 team I've been with the U.S. team in that halfpipe coach role. Cool. So so since 2006 you've been the head halfpipe coach. Uh, a lot has happened since then. Well, well, no, not really. You know, so I worked with Mike Jankowski uh -huh. for the first until 2010, and then he kind of transitioned into being the. <clears throat> The, he's like the head overall head coach for freestyle or free skiing and snowboarding, both mm -hmm. slope style and half pipe. So he became kind of, Foley's boss. No, he's not. He's not Foley's boss. It's kind of <laughs> confusing. Foley's Foley's the head the head head guy, but okay. Mike kind of handles the um, the other side, and Foley deals with a lot of the stuff with the FIS and. Ooh. Um, he knows the Olympics better than anyone. He's the he's politician. The <laughs> he, yes, he's and he's really good at um, making you know having the athletes' best interests in mind and making decisions for the whole team based on what's going to be best for the most amount of athletes. And yeah. and I mean, so yeah, so basically after 2010, I became the the head coach of the half pipe team and then okay, okay. Um, 
so so let's talk about this. Like you have had so many wins. I mean, I've got half the wins at least in half pipe riding have been under your coaching, right? In the last since since you became I don't know since two thousand and ten, let's say, right? And um, what are some of the highlights? The things that like stick out in your mind, either that you were really proud of the athlete or like those highlight moments in your coaching career where you you shared that accomplishment with your athletes or were just stoked on an athlete? Well, hands down, number one is Sean White at this last Olympics. Hands down. That was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen anybody do anywhere. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would actually go beyond saying that he's the best half-pipe rider of all time. I would actually say that he's one of the greatest athletes of all time. Like, I would put that performance on like a level of almost like a Jordan or something else to overcome those mental yeah. uh, like obstacles, right? That that to yeah. be like tr- like transcendent yeah. snowboarding, you know? Yeah, and and the thing that a lot of people don't know is the slams that he took the season before in like that summer. I mean, most people would have never gotten up and continued to try to push it like he did, and he. I mean, there's the the one that is well documented where he bashed his face open. But he, I mean, he wrecked so many more times, and he is yeah. You don't get mental, stitches every time, you know. <laughs> no, no, his mental um, strength and his desire to be the best is ridiculous. I mean, it's really yeah. amazing to me. And he's 31 years old when he did that, and. I mean, I've known Sean. I used to compete with him. He's been competing for a long time, and he's, you know, he's gotten a bad rap, you know, occasionally because of, you know, he keeps to himself. But I think for him, he's just, he's just kind of a, he's actually a quiet dude who's been forced into the spotlight and has to engage with people. And I think naturally he just doesn't really want to do that, so he has to like force himself to go out and talk to people and stuff and. But he, that performance was hands down one of the most amazing things to be a part of. And, and granted, JJ is his main coach. And but you know, it was really cool to have a good rapport with him and JJ going into the Olympics. And you know, they came to our camp that we had in Copper, and that was where he did the first cap 14 that he did since he mm-hmm. had that horrible wreck in New Zealand. And you know, just help you know being there to help those guys out support them um give them advice when and where he needed it um and him being open to it and just watching him being able to step up and and do that run in a do or die moment was i mean one of the coolest things i've ever been a part of in snowboarding for Um, me too competition wise yeah second secondly close behind that would be scotty lego at the 2010 olympics though because that when he got the bronze medal like he he had had he'd been struggling the year before and even that season he would win qualifiers and then crash in the finals and he really just um had a good game plan that day and he was trying to do this front nine with his nose, like front nine nose, like he does. But the place that he was doing it in the pipe, he was just popping him super bad. And you know, he's got like Sean, one of the best front fives of all time in the half pipe. And so, you know, right before his last run, I was like, dude, just don't do the nine, like do the five. And that kind of blew his mind for a second. But you know, he dropped in and did his run with massive front 10 kind of double wobbly um cab double 10 you know he did backside air front double 10 cab double 10 and then front five and then the scotty lego back nine which is also famous mm-hmm. and uh landed it super clean and got on the podium and you know everyone thought that yuri had a, you know one of those podium spots locked up and he bumped yuri down to fourth and you know that was one of the coolest things I'd ever seen too I mean just Scotty is one of my another one of my favorite all time humans and snowboarders because he is just a a real dude and and just a funny likable um, selfless guy really actually so he you know I was so stoked for him 
and then you know from the the other great olympic moment would be um obviously chloe kim winning this year under immense pressure and you know mm-hmm. everyone was expecting her to win and she was 18 at the time mm-hmm. yeah, ton well, of pressure yeah i, I mean like, talk talk so, about that briefly i mean she's a korean american her father is from korea yeah. and then you go to korea yeah. and it's like all the all the Korean people want you to win, kind of. All the Americans want you to win, and all the yeah. sponsors definitely want you to win. <laughs> yeah, and and she was getting hounded left and right over there, which is the thing that nobody knows. Like, what do you mean? She had to have security. She had to have security, like, walk from the bus to the venue because, like, the workers at the Olympics were trying to get autographs and take selfies with her. And then if she got anywhere near the public, you know, she would just be mobbed. And then I guess when she won, the scene at the bottom of the half pipe was, you know, just mayhem of people just crowding her and like bedlam and people just trying to get in there and get their shot with Chloe and this and that. Um, Nick Alexikos, who's been the press officer at the last several Olympics he said it was the craziest thing he'd ever seen really he's a big guy too he, he probably was, had to create some a, space he, he was a big guy trying to create some space but there was secret service there trying to like really secret service and, wow yeah well they have not secret service they have the state department it's the okay. state department but they're they're there like undercover people that are there to protect U.S. athletes at the Olympics and, wow um, they had to you know they were like they had to form a circle around her and try to push people away it was that crazy so crazy yeah that was pretty cool but on that same note equally as cool was Arielle Gold coming off of the worst season of her life the year before landing the run of her life at the Olympics and getting the bronze medal that was she worked so hard for that and um, she did everything she needed to do to change her game change her mindset and um, that that was equally as cool as Chloe winning in my book. Cool. So, right yeah. on. Well, those are some, those are, some pretty incredible moments, actually. Moments. Yeah. Um, well, well, that'll wrap up part one of our interview. Um, this has uh, been Ricky Bauer, head coach of the U.S. snowboard team. Thank you, Ricky. On behalf of Mark Sullivan and the Beef, Thanks for listening to the Snowboard Project. Remember, ride fast, take chances, dream big, and take action. And for God's sake, don't be a pussy. Don't forget to support advertising free snowboarding media at patreon.com. The Snowboard Project. The The Snowboard snowboard project. Project. The Snowboard Project.